This has been by far the video people have requested for me to make the most in my YouTube career. And it is, so far, the longest video I have made. In this video I will try to correct the things I believe are wrong in the video made by Laserpig on T14 Armata. Now I just want to say I don't have anything against him and I am very much against anyone trying to harass him or his fans. Because people make mistakes, I made mistakes myself and in fact I still do and I have made plenty of them in the past. So just because someone makes mistakes doesn't have to mean they are always wrong. In fact, he says a lot of things that are correct in his video, but I want to try and correct some things I believe to be incorrect based on my research. Also, I know the video sometimes makes some claims that are supposed to be jokes, but a lot of people are not tank nerds and they might take those jokes at face value. Therefore, if you see stuff that you believe is a joke, don't think that I'm not aware of that. It's just that I want to make things clear. Also, he spends a big chunk of the video talking about politics and Russian economics, which I'm not in position to talk about since I have no knowledge on such topics. I'm just a massive tank nerd, so all the mistakes I will be covering will be related to the tanks only. So, let's begin. An autoloader famous for jamming that now cannot be accessed and cleared when it does jam. I don't know where the idea of the Soviet era autoloaders being unreliable comes from, but that is definitely not the case. If maintained, they will function properly. It is a very simple system really. A rotating carousel, an elevator and a ramic stick. The only information about these being unreliable is from the development of the T64, when the autoloader was a new thing and they had some reliability issues. But we have had several interviews with tankers from both sides of the Ukraine war, and no one has even mentioned the autoloaders having any issues. Not to mention that we have absolutely no visual evidence for that either. With thousands of tanks with the Soviet-era outloaders fighting in this war, we would have heard at least something, but so far, nothing. That is because they are not famous for being unreliable, that's just false. A CIA report about Soviet tanks even praised the reliability of the T-72's outloader. And immediately they went about abandoning the philosophy of the T-72 and its ridiculous carousel autoloader, the system which has produced some of Russia's greatest memes, and instead incorporated a more French-style cartridge autoloading system, featuring a rear ammunition compartment complete with blowout panels to protect the crew. The prototype of T-14 Armata, the Object 195, sometimes referred to as T-95, did in fact not feature a bustle autoloader, but a carousel autoloader, which is also featured on T-14 Armata. That is one of the many similarities it has with the T-14 and why people say it is its predecessor. Not only would this new autoloading system allow the T-95 to fire considerably faster than the T-90, it would also allow it to fire the more powerful and more modern shells that, to this day, the T-90 still cannot use. T-95 would have featured a completely different gun caliber, 252mm 2A83 which would, in fact, allow it to fire more powerful ammunition. But T-90M, on the other hand, has been modified to fire modern ammunition, which would be the 3BM-59 and 3BM-60, the latter also being confirmed to be used in Ukraine, which are inferior to modern western ones, but they are still modern, as well as the programmable high-explosive called Telnik, featured in Zvezda's documentary on the tank. Now, there is no evidence that this modern projectile has actually entered service, but the point is, T-90M can fire it, therefore it can fire modern projectiles. T-95. The tank was shown at the Omnis Arms Convention in 1997, but if you had a time machine and went back in time to see the T-95 in action, prepare to be disappointed. The tank was kept as far away as physically possible from the crowds and observation platforms, it was covered in camouflage netting, and did nothing more than drive around for a bit before being taken away. It would only ever be seen once more in a 1999 arms convention in Siberia, where it would drive around this time a little faster and even pause for a photo op, but spent most of its time hidden under a tarp. Object 195 was never shown on any arms conventions, nor would it ever pose for any photo ops. The images we have are all from some military bases or testing grounds where it is, as Laserpig said himself, always kept under a tarp. See, the thing is, the T-95 
never existed. In 2009, it was revealed by one Colonel Vladimir Voitov, who had apparently been in charge of the project, that the whole thing was never real. The T-95 shown was in actuality a prototype for an elongated T-80 tank that had been built in the 1980s but had never gone anywhere. This would later become recycled into something called the Black Eagle Project, an upgrade package for the T-80, which also never went anywhere. I see where the problem is here. The information Laserpick presented for the T-95 appears to be mixed up with another T-95, the Object 640 Black Eagle. This tank was in fact shown on arms, exposed and posed for photo ops among other things, and when I searched the name of the Colonel Vladimir Voitov together with the term T-95, the only results that came up were once about Object 640. Vladimir Voitov was never involved with the Object 195. So how could this confusion have happened? Well, Russian media decided to dub a Black Eagle ST-95 for whatever reason, and that name sort of caught on. There are many articles calling Object 640 ST-95. Now, when Object 195 information became public, people who worked on it or knew about it from before often referred to it as T-95, which made sense since the tank is named Object 195, same as Object 172 became T-72. Object 640 was the last-ditch effort for the Omsk Transmash, the factory which was tasked with production and development of T-80 tanks, to gain some funding since the plant was close to bankruptcy. That is why they were bringing the tank to arms expos and showed it off as much as they could. It was an attempt to get some customers, but they ultimately failed and the plant was bankrupt and was then bought off by Urovagon Zavod. And I think it goes without saying, but this tank had very little to nothing to do with the Armata. Object 195 on the other hand was a different story. The first prototype was built in the year of 2000, so it couldn't have even participated in the arms expos mentioned in the video. It featured a V212X layout engine, to which we will get to later, to a 83 152mm gun, pretty much identical hull to the one of T-14, and it was, in fact, the first MPT prototype to receive Relict Explosive Reactive Armor, some even claiming that Relict was designed specifically for it. The tank resembles T-14 quite a bit, and for a reason. After the tank prototypes, yes, there were several, passed the state trials, where one drove for 15,000 kilometers and fired 287 shots, which of course cannot be done with a wooden cannon, the project was ultimately cancelled in 2010, when it was first made public. But the manufacturer claimed that they will continue the work on a new machine based on this project, which most definitely referred to the T-14. Now, if the tank was so good and passed all the trials, why was it cancelled? Well, there are two theories. First one from the manufacturer claims that the tank was too advanced and that all the features for it were just not ready yet which is somewhat true, especially considering the fact that thermal imagers were not of the high enough standard as expected for the tank. But all of the technology could be upgraded on the tank, thermal imagers could simply be replaced by new ones, etc. But according to Alexei Hlopotov, who was at the time one of the higher-ups of the NIIIM, plant tasked with developing tank armors, the manufacturer wanted to get more money, and what a better way to get more money from the state than to say that you need it for another project instead of upgrading the T-95 and making modernizations for it, they decided to cancel it and develop a new tank, because new designs get much more funding than modernization projects. So ultimately, corruption in Russia basically led to the end of this promising project. The engine. With the exception of the T-64 and some models of the T-80, every Russian tank and BMP has used the same engine, a modification of the Kharkiv Model V2, the same engine used on the Soviet Second World War era BT-7, though it's more famously for being used in the T-34 and KV series of tanks. The V2 engine wasn't really designed for BT-7, or vice versa. In fact, BT-7 originally did not even have the V2 engine. It was only the BT-7M that received it, and it was only in 1939 that BT-7M came out, where it was used for testing the engine, and just a couple of months after that, the engine was adopted for T-34 and KV-1 tanks. Yes, BT-7M was accepted into service as well, but as I said already, this engine was not designed for BT-7, it was designed for tank use in general, hence why we have light, medium and heavy tanks, all adopting the same engine pretty much at the same time. 
and it's the same engine that is being used in the latest models of the T90, giving it the classic title of the Kalashnikovs of engines. It is not. V92 S2F does use the V2 as basis, since it is a further evolution of the engine, but the engine has gone through so many changes and upgrades that it is no longer the same. Visually even, the only comparable thing is the V-shape and the angle of the piston chambers. That is it. Not to mention the numerous changes the engine went through since the introduction of V2. I know he said it is not actually the same engine, but people generally just hear that piece of information and believe that the T90M uses an engine from the 30s, which is not the case at all. Most of the things on the engine have been radically changed and improved. It is simply not the same engine. It is a big leap over the old V2. The V92 S2F is over two times more powerful than the original V2, and making the engine that much more powerful is not a simple process. It took decades of upgrades and innovation to achieve that. Problem with the V2, while it's still fairly reliable and is an engine that do what engines do, it is, at its core, a design that is 84 years old. The design of diesel engines has dramatically changed and improved since 1937. The age of the engine does not really mean much in this case. The engine of the Leopard 2 is 60 years old. It surely must be bad then, right? I mean, it is much closer in history to the V2 than it is to today. By all things considered, it is an old engine, and the technology has advanced a lot since then. Yet, it is still being used in the latest variants of the Leopard 2 and even the advanced KF-51 Panther, a 60-year-old engine being used in one of the most advanced NATO tanks, which features very little to no changes since it was originally designed. And in fact, official information of the Challenger 2's engine, which is also the engine for the new Challenger 3, states that it builds upon the legacy of the original Condor engine, the engine from 1918. That does not mean that CV-12 is a bad engine even in the slightest. In fact, it is a massive improvement over the Condor and shares very little with it. But I just want to point out that just because the original engine is old, does not have to mean that what came from it in modern era is in any way bad. To the point where the Western domestic market has overtaken the Russian military market. To put that in perspective, the engine of the Honda Jazz generates only slightly less torque than the V12 of the T90 main battle tank. This one is completely incorrect. To his credit, he did state that it was a mistake in the description of the video, but since 90 plus percent of people don't usually read the description, I decided to point it out in this video. The engine of Honda Jazz produces much less torque than the engine of the T90M. It is not even funny how far apart in performance they are. The V2, while it still works, is extremely bulky, extremely heavy, and incredibly archaic in its design. It is not really. Of course, if you look at some of the most advanced diesel engine designs for tanks, you could make such an argument. But if you look at the diesel engines currently being used in NATO tanks, it is far from it. V92 S2F, the most modern variant, is very comparable in size to the Challenger's CV-12 engine and has very similar performance, where CV-12 has a bit more horsepower and V92 has a bit more torque, but it is much lighter. CV-12's thigh weight is stated to be 1980 kilograms, while V92 S2F weighs 1050 kilograms, almost two times lighter, so it is far from being heavy and it is pretty much as bulky as CV-12. Now let's look at MTU-873, the engine of Leopard 2 and KF-51. This engine is much bigger than both CV-12 and V92, and also weighs more, its dry weight being around 2200 kg. Granted, this engine does produce more horsepower and torque, but if we are going to talk about the bulky and heavy, then this is it. And of course, again, none of this is to say that any of these engines are bad. I personally don't believe they are. They are all pretty decent in their own way. And though it weighs the same as the Abrams 80G1500 gas turbine engines, with both being slightly over one ton in weight, the Abrams can push the 52 ton tank up to 42 miles an hour. Comparing a diesel engine to a gas turbine is not really fair in my opinion. Gas turbines are generally well known for their big output in a small package. In fact, that is the reason why Soviets went to the gas turbine when they first designed the T-80. They saw that they could make an engine of a small size that would give them much more power than the already existing V-46 and 5TD diesel engines at the time. 
Of course, one big negative aspect of gas turbines is their fuel consumption, but everything has its upsides and downsides. So it would be much more fair to compare the modern Russian diesel to a modern Western diesel, something I've been doing in this video. It would have also made more sense to compare the AGT-1500 gas turbine to the Russian gas turbine, the GTT-1250, where we would see that AGT-1500 is still superior, it's just that the difference is not that drastic. The T-90, in spite of being almost 10 tons lighter, can only move at a top speed of 32 miles per hour. T-90's maximum speed is in fact not 32 miles per hour or 51 km per hour, it is 60 km per hour or 37 miles per hour. Every single source I checked, from the books to pamphlets of the manufacturer, gives this as the tank's maximum speed. It's also extremely thirsty, not just for fuel, but for oxygen, making it prone to overheating and burning out at high altitude, which became a huge problem for India when it found its T-90s kept breaking down in the mountainous regions between it and China, which meant during many of its border skirmishes with China, a lot of its troops lacked urgent tank support, which led to India restarting its previously cancelled in-house tank comedy program, the Arjun. This is not the reason for the development of the Arjun tank. Arjun tank was in fact developed for the desert areas between Pakistan and India, where T-90 tanks actually have problems. For the mountains, they really don't. In fact, during a border crisis in 2020 between China and India, India deployed some of their T-90 tanks there without any issues. T-90 to this day remains India's tank of choice for the border area with China. Of course, it is not ideal, hence why India started a light tank project that is supposed to be used in the mountainous areas since China has already designed one for that use, the ZTQ-15. In short, as a tank, the T-90 should be one of the fastest main battle tanks out there. In reality, it's just as fast as the British Challenger II, a tank which weighs 20 tons heavier than it. Both T-90 and Challenger II have a maximum speed of 60 km per hour, but that is not really the correct way to measure the speed of a tank. Sure, maximum speed matters, but it does not matter nearly as much as acceleration. T-90, being 20 tons lighter, and having a comparable engine, will reach certain speeds much quicker than Challenger 2 will. Tanks don't ever drive their maximum speed on a battlefield, so much is evident by all the footage we get from Ukraine. Combat with tanks never requires the tanks to drive 50 or 60 km per hour, that is just the maximum speed they can reach on the asphalt road anyway. What T-90 does have inferior to its western counterparts, though, is the reverse speed. I have always brought it up in my videos and I will bring it up again. The fact that T-64, T-72 and T-90 still can't reverse faster than the walking pace is absolutely horrible. And in their brilliance that could only possibly come to a bunch of people high on mountain air and vodka, decided just to copy the German SLA-16. You know, the engine from the Second World War Nazi tank the Porsche Tiger. The famously unreliable. SLA-16 was not the engine used on Porsche Tiger. It was an engine designed for heavy combat vehicles, most notably Tiger II and Yak Tiger, that ultimately ended up nowhere. It is not famous for being unreliable because, well, it was never used in order for it to reach such infamy. The reason they went with this engine is because Russia didn't want to rely on Western imports. Russian and Soviet engines never relied on Western imports. V2 variants, as well as the opposed piston and gas turbine engines are all fully domestically made, and as you will see soon, this engine has been in development for too long for it to be designed for that purpose. It might have also been because a considerable number of them had been captured by the advancing Red Army during the Second World War. There had been considerable studies of the engine and a Russian modified version of it now existed. There is no evidence whatsoever to suggest that the engine was copied by the Russians and now became the A85 3A, the engine of T-14. The only source for this claim is the media article Laserpick put in his sources, but even this poorly written article states that the engine was developed on the basis of the SLA-16, not that it is its direct copy or anything similar. The article in question has a lot of mistakes, some of which I will get to later, and does not cite any experts or officials, nor does it source anything even similar to official information. Which is funny, because top 4 articles usually have sources in them, this one, as we can see, does not. Which probably means the author wrote it based on his own assumptions, which is obviously not a good source. Now, let us see, is A85-3 a copy of SLA-16? Well, the short answer is no, it is not. 
The long answer is that the engines are vastly different. The only thing they share in common is their X layout. Everything from cylinder blocks and cooling to the basic visual differences between the two is different. The SLA-16 was a much bigger, bulkier engine which produced much less power. An even bigger SLA-16 variant that would reach facing 100 horsepower was supposedly developed, but everything is different when compared to the A85, the RPM, size, weight and the already mentioned differences. This leads us to the conclusion that the A85 is not, in fact, a copy of the SLA-16. Soviets had some development of X layout engines, earliest of which is from 1954, but 2V16 and 2V12 series from the 70s and 80s, from which the A85 originates, show very different design ideas. And the only similar thing to the SLA-16 is, again, the X layout. Most of the articles bringing up SLA-16 never actually claim that A85 is the copy of this engine, mostly just state that it's based on it. This is mostly because SLA-16 was the first X layout engine for tanks, but it was not the first X engine. That honor belongs to Henry Ford, who was the first to patent the X layout engine. Saying that T-14 used the German SLA-16 because it was the first X engine for tanks is like saying that Abrams uses the German BMW GT-101 from World War II, since it was the first gas turbine engine for tanks. In reality, neither AGT-1500 nor A85 share much with the set engines other than their type, how to say. The fact of the matter is, there is no actual evidence to indicate SLA-16 being used as either basis for Armata's engine or that the Armata's engine is a copy of it. The problem was, this version of the engine they wanted, the A85-3, had been built to power oil compressing and pumping stations not heavy vehicles. The engine had been a complete commercial failure. No one wanted it because, surprise surprise, it was unreliable. But you're all looked upon this unreliable, modified, commercial failure of a pumping engine, ripped out of a Second World War German tank famed for breaking down constantly, and thought, yes, from this engine, we shall build a new Russian tank. As already established, A85 is a further development of the 2V series of engines that started in the 1970s. The only source for the oil rig claim is the already mentioned Top 4 article, which Laserpig has listed on their sources. The problem is that another one of his sources directly contradicts this. A source from Gurhan, which does cite a deputy minister of defense, states that the engine was developed for heavy combat vehicles like Armata, which is actually correct. The only connection between A85 and the oil pumps is a short advert from GTZ that states that it is one of the possible applications. The advert is from 2011, and the advert does mention other engines and that they are being used in combat vehicles. The most likely reason why they don't mention it being used in a secret prototype tank is, well, because it was a secret prototype tank. The engine is also not unreliable at all. It has passed state trials during the Object 195 tests, which ended in 2010. Several engines also underwent heavy trials and officially passed all of those. There is actually no evidence to suggest that the engine is unreliable at all, which brings us to the next point. It is perhaps for this reason that when the T-14 was first seen during a rehearsal for the Red Square Parade through Moscow, it broke down. T-14 did not break down on the parade. It is a pretty much well-established fact by now that the reason is that the driver accidentally engaged the handbrake which is evident by the fact that the recovery vehicle is unable to move the tank one inch. If the engine or transmission broke, the other parts of the running gear should still be functional. That is how recovery vehicles can recover the tanks whose engines or transmissions have been damaged in combat. The tank is later unhooked from the recovery vehicle, the crew goes back in and drives it off, without anyone even opening the engine bay to check on the engine or transmission. They simply go back in and drive it off. Compare this to, for example, when Ukrainian BM Opelt actually broke down on a parade. They simply towed it away with a truck, and a full recovery vehicle was unable to move the T-14 at all. T-14 was built around the engine, specifically that engine. During the development of the Object 195, the A85-3, or the 2 v 12 engine, was chosen as the engine that would power the tank. It was more compact than other diesel engines Russia had, and produced much more power. All things considered, it was the best possible choice. The tank was then designed to perfectly fit the engine. But that is basically how all tanks are designed. You don't make a tank and then decide what you're going to fit inside. You first go through the development process where the engine is chosen, 
and then you design the engine compartment around the chosen power pack. If it was the other way around, tanks would either have unnecessary empty space or would not have enough space for the chosen engine. It simply makes sense to design a tank around the engine. Let's take Clapper 2 for example. During the development, the MTU873 engine was chosen. This engine was designed for use in the Kampfpanzer 70, therefore it was made before the Leopard 2 was designed. Engineers decided to implement this engine in the tank and design the engine compartment for it. And putting bigger engines in already developed tanks has happened many times in the past, that is simply not the issue. In fact, the original 16-cylinder X layout, the 2V16, was made for use in standard Russian tanks. The prototype just had simple extensions to fit the engine. Now I could talk about how in spite of the specifications for a tank with a low profile that's lighter and faster than its predecessor the T90, the T14 is considerably larger, about 20 tons heavier. T14 and Object 195 were never supposed to be smaller and lighter than the T90. As Sergei Maev, who was in charge of the Object 195 project, put it, modern anti-tank weapons will find the tank based on its thermal signature, so it can be as low to the ground as you want, it will still get hit. And since T14 is a direct continuation of the Object 195, no, it was not meant to be small. And about the weight, no, it is not 20 tons heavier. Original information about the weight was putting the tank at 48 metric tons, but that was just a farce, because that is the weight of the tank without any extra modules. Actual weight is said to be in between 52 to 55 metric tons, which would put it around 4 to 7 tons heavier than the T90M or 6 to 9 tons heavier than the T90A, not 20 tons. But it turns out he's got periscopes behind him. That is his only way of seeing. Which is fine if you were designing a tank built in the 80s or 90s, but in the West, periscopes are now being seen more as a backup site rather than a main. Periscopes are fragile. Regardless of how strong you make the glass, it's still glass. So more modern tanks are built with small optical cameras and screens being the primary sight. The 14 Armata, just like many modern Western tanks, has a camera mounted on the front of the tank, which also includes thermal vision. The view from the camera is displayed on the monitor located to the right of the driver, which is visible on interior photos of T14 Armata as well as in many other instances. This information, by the way, is provided in the source that LaserPig listed himself. The source states, and I quote, The monitor displays an image from a front view thermal imaging device located on the upper part of the nose assembly of the hull. The monitor is not even much different in size than what Western tanks have. Here is, for example, the monitor that displays the forward-looking Spectus system of modern Leopard 2 tanks, specifically Leopard 2A7 in this case. You might be wondering why I haven't taken the Abrams tank as an example here. Well, the reason for that is that Abrams does not have a forward-looking camera that is displayed on the monitor for the driver to use. The only thing available to modern Abrams tanks is the VEA thermal display, which is used only for driving at night. It is installed instead of the center periscope and is not used for day driving since thermals can't see shadows, so seeing bumps and other obstacles can be much harder. The only camera that is present on Abrams all the time is the rear view camera for driving in reverse. So not all modern Western tanks have cameras for driving, some still very much rely on periscopes, which is not really a bad thing, especially if those periscopes provide a good view, like in the case of Abrams with the periscopes acting as backups, which can be retracted down into the hull during combat if they aren't needed. I've never heard of such feature to be honest, and having talked with some NATO tankers, they told me that this is not a thing. You can remove periscopes for replacement, but retract them so they don't get damaged? You cannot. But periscope removal has been a thing since their inception, so that is nothing special. Removing periscopes also leaves a hole, so that is definitely something you don't want to do during combat. And for comparison, this is the driver's position of the KF-51 Panther. Image shown here is that of the KF-51's commander, not the driver, which can be seen by the fact that the station is located on the left side of the tank. The gun is visible as well as the turret basket. Sadly, we do not have any images of the KF-51's driver station, so we can't know if the display is any different than the one of Lapper 2. The autoloader can apparently reload each round in around 10 seconds, which makes it slower than both the T-80 and T-72 respectively, and considerably slower than the Abrams, of which the qualifying time for a loader to pass training is 7 seconds. We don't know what is the reload speed of T-14 Armata, such information is still classified, 
Most of the information about the reload speed are the claims of 10 to 12 rounds per minute, not 10 seconds. But none of that is actually official, and it wouldn't make sense for the reload speed to be so drastically changed, from around 7 seconds, which is the reload speed of other Russian tanks, to 10 seconds, that is a 40% increase. And yeah, most of the Western tanks, like Abrams and Leopard 2, do have faster reload, where loaders can load a new round in 5 to 7 seconds, depending on the situation. But in most cases, that difference is not that relevant. It usually takes the gunner more time to acquire a new target than it takes a loader to load a new round. Of course, there are situations where it is helpful, like if the gunner misses a target, for example, but in most cases, it is not as important. Pro-Ukrainian hackers found that most of the electronic systems on board, including the digital sights, the night vision, the infrared, were all in fact Western imports. Most notably, these were last-generation French optics from the Leclerc MBT, left over from when they were all upgraded to Icon in 2009. I could find absolutely nothing about this. Best I could find about T14 using French optics is an article from 2015 speculating if T14 has thermal images from Thales, because, well, Russian tanks were all using them in 2015. Which would make sense, but nowhere on the internet can I find information that those are leftover sites from upgraded Leclerc's. Also, even if T14s were or are using French thermals, it is very unlikely that they are using the second generation thermals. Russians were purchasing Catherine XP from Thales for their CITVs implemented on T-72B1MS and T-90MS tanks, the same CITV used on T-14 Armata. Therefore, it is very likely that if they were getting thermals from Thales, it would be 3rd generation Katarin XP and not the 2nd generation FC for their T14 Armata tanks. So this claim would really require some search to back it up. These optics are... how can I put this... available to the public. I do not know what available to the public is supposed to refer to, if he means that you can go in and buy them as an individual with no relation to the military procurement, you can't. These thermals are not available to the public to just go in and buy. But if he means available as in the information about them is public, yes it is. That is because those companies, like Thales in this case, are always looking for customers and need the information to always be available. But so is the case with the latest NATO thermals, like for example Attica, which is used on many tanks like Laboratory 7 or New Challenger 3. The information about it is mostly public, and you can find a lot about it on the internet. And they're not even the best that are currently available. If you've got a spare five grand, you can go into any high-end spy gadget store and buy a drone that will give you better night vision and IR tracking capabilities than the latest generation of modern Russian tanks. Those drones will not give you the performance anywhere close to the one of the thermals installed on T-14 Armata or T-90N tanks. These thermals have sensors of lower resolution are also uncooled and thus have much shorter detection and recognition range. That is because cooled, military-grade thermals are bulky and can only be installed in much bigger drones, such as those used by the military, like Bayraktar. Because the Chinese were once interested in buying the T-14, and according to their own media, which is usually fairly pro-Russian, according to the Chinese, the tank was in Syria but did not see any combat. The rumor that their government was planning to purchase the T-14 almost became a major scandal in China. Chinese media blasted the tank because according to a report they published to the media, none of the tank's defense systems actually worked. I could not find any source stating these claims. So I asked a couple of my Chinese friends to try and find something since, well, I don't speak Chinese. And the only thing they managed to find after a long time of searching were some social media posts or some bloggers talking negatively about the tank, nothing given remotely official. That is probably because China was actually never interested in acquiring the T-14 Armata, since they had recently finished developing their latest tank, ZTC-99A, and are, themselves, pushing for exporting their tanks as much as possible. Getting T-14 from Russians would not only make their latest tank modernizations useless, it would also show to their customers that they would rather use Russian tanks than their own, so why would anyone buy something from them then? In reality, China was never interested in T-14 and never even tested it, so just like the claim about the Cleric Thermal being used, this one also needs something to back it up.
its modular design. In the case of the T-14, the tank is built with the idea that the chassis, that's this lower part with the wheels in it, can be used on an entire family of vehicles. Standardization and modularity like this is fairly common, especially in the military. It was one of the major strengths of the M113. It was the core design philosophy of the British Army in the 70s, and even the modern highly publicised HIMAR systems is part of a family of vehicles which all use the same basic structure. But here's the thing, and the examples of modular designs I just gave you, those are all light vehicles. And there's a reason for that. Point is, all these vehicles are sort of backline vehicles. An artillery tractor or a mortar carrier or, or hell, this thing is going to be way behind the lines. So why does it need to be armoured? The idea of a universal platform is not new, in fact, many vehicles have been built on tank chassis without being originally designed for modularity. And just because the chassis is the same does not mean the armour and engine, and therefore weight and fuel consumption, would be the same. The idea is that you would make the same chassis but change a lot of other components, armour being one of them. In fact, if we look at T14, T15 and T16, we will see that their hull designs are completely different. The idea here is about the chassis, not the tank. But as I already said, this is not a new thing, not even in Russia. Vehicles like BMPT infantry fighting vehicle, Musta self-propelled gun, Bram recovery vehicles, 2A7 Peon, TOS-1 system, IMR-2M engineer vehicle, bridge layers, mine clearing vehicles, even mobile S-300 systems have all been made on tank chassis. The idea here is about the chassis. Most of these vehicles that I listed don't even have the same armor, nor the same engine. Russians promoting the modularity of the Armata platform is mostly just propaganda. In reality, most of the tanks can be converted to anything you like. The only exception is something like an infantry fighting vehicle or other vehicles that you expect to see frontline combat, but those remain lightly armoured because they only need to protect the troops inside from small arms fire, mortars and improvised explosives. Speed and maneuverability is how you survive as an IFV, not tanking hits with your armour. That's the job of tanks. A lot of the modern infantry fighting vehicles are being made to take hits from AT launchers because the technology has advanced enough for them to retain mobility and practicality while having their protection improved. And it is not the tank's job to tank hits. There is a reason why everyone is talking about the protection onion for tanks. Your tank being hit is always one of the last layers in the onion because you don't really want that to happen. Even if your tank is the most very well armored, you can never fully protect it and there is always a chance that it will get destroyed. Things like the BMP and the various support vehicles which use them as a base are all built on a tank chassis that share the same V2 engine as most Russian tanks, which means it's a thirsty, thirsty boy. BMP is not made on a tank chassis. It does borrow some things from the PT-76 light tank, like the role design for the tracks, design of the amphibious propulsion, among other minor things. But other than that, no, it is not made on a tank chassis. And even if it was made on the chassis of the PT-76, that is a light amphibious tank. It does not consume a lot of fuel. Speaking of that, BMPs do not use the V2 engine. The engine used in BMP is UTD-20. This engine is not V2. It is a V layout diesel, like many others out there, but it is definitely not a V2. The angle of the piston chambers is different, has less cylinders, and is simply not the same. This engine is much smaller and produces less power, therefore is nowhere near as fuel-hungry as the tank engines are. This engine was made to power lighter vehicles, like BMPs in this case, not tanks. S-235 SPG, also based on the tank chassis, this time the T-90, something that is designed to operate well behind the lines, fire several highly accurate artillery shots, and then move quickly before counter-battery can hit home. Why does it need to be armoured? Things like the Paladin or the AS-90 may look armoured, but in reality they're not. A lot of SPGs are very heavy, including the one being shown in the background, the Panzerhaubitze 2000. This SPG weighs around 56 metric tons, which is heavier than Russian Musta S and Qualitia SPGs. Yet it is considered as one of the best in the world, and is also being currently used by Ukrainians to fight Russians, despite being very heavy. To the T-14's turret being able to track a target without input from the gunner, something tanks have been able to do since the 1960s. Tanks did not have automatic target tracking in the 60s. 
Automatic target tracking is only possible with modern fire control systems. What he probably meant is automatic lead, which calculates where the shot would land based on the manual tracking of the target. Once engaged, automatic lead will automatically move the gun in an appropriate position to hit the moving target. Automatic target tracking uses the thermal signature of the target to lock onto it, where then the fire control system automatically keeps the target in the crosshair and always compensates for its movement. This feature is, in fact, not present in many modern tanks, including M1A2, sep 3 and Leopard 2A7, which still only have access to the old system, the automatic lead. But Russian tanks like T-72B3, T-90M, T-80BVM and T-14 Armata all have this feature. Anyone who has had a chance to try these tanks in Steel Beasts will know what I'm talking about. Some of the newer NATO tanks are said to have automatic target tracking like Challenger 3, but most actually don't. The major problem with the Challenger in games like that is its gun, it's rifled, which allows for greater accuracy over longer ranges. This is an old myth, very old in fact. Many have disputed this myth over and over again. Seeing Laserpig mention it is really surprising, I'm not gonna lie. On top of not providing any advantages in accuracy, Challenger 2, just like any modern tank, uses fin-stabilized sub-caliber projectiles. Although being rifled, the sabre of the sub-caliber projectiles has rings on it which ride the rifling of the barrel and prevent the rest of the projectile from spinning. Once it leaves the barrel, the sabre disassembles together with the ring bearings and sends the armor-piercing projectile forward, using the stabilization from the fins. Now, there is the hash projectile which does use rifling of the barrel to spin the projectile for stabilization, but there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that it is more accurate. Modern Spoonberg guns are just as accurate, if not more accurate, than the rifled guns, which are now considered mostly obsolete for tank use, because they wear off much faster than the smoothbore ones, hence why Challenger 3 is receiving the smoothbore L55A1 gun. That comes at the cost of not being able to use the more modern and more powerful NATO anti-tank rounds, making it weaker to more modern tanks. The Challenger uses Hesh rounds to compensate for this, which most video games famously do not model particularly well. Hesh is an obsolete projectile. Modern programmable high explosive are very much superior to it. In fact, even regular high explosive frag used by the Russians is a superior type of projectile. Hesh was used like a dual purpose, anti-infantry and anti-tank, where it would create spalling from the tank's armor to neutralize the target. The introduction of composite armors completely negated its effect, because the spalling created on the outer layer would be stopped by all other layers in the tank's armor. On top of that, Modern armors have way too much thickness to be affected by hash, so saying that War Thunder does not model it properly is also incorrect. When it comes to dealing with modern armors, at least. In anti-infantry role, it is also inferior, because it is not a fragmentation projectile, that is, it does not have any dedicated fragments that would fly off to neutralize soft targets, and on top of that, it has very thin walls, which would not create very good fragmentation. So, its anti-tank and anti-infantry capabilities are outclassed by any modern projectile. Well, for one, they just put a different gun on it. Because there is a version of the Challenger 2 which uses a smoothbore cannon and can use the same ammunition as both the Germans and the Americans. It's called the Challenger Clip, and it's been available since 2006. Challenger 2 Clip is not readily available. It was just a prototype to showcase the use of the 120mm NATO smoothbore gun. It is not available to anyone because it was just an experimental vehicle, it is not being offered for sale. In the long term, there are a number of proposed upgrade packages to the Challenger, coined under the umbrella term of HAAIP. These include more powerful engines, better suspensions, updated sights, electronic warfare packages, soft and hard kill systems, new turret systems, and even a vastly improved armor system, which can allegedly protect the tank against multiple hits from more modern NATO rounds. Challenger 2 upgrades do not install any additional protection on top of the frontal composite armor, so the protection level, in a way of what kind of projectiles it can protect from, remains the same. And there is no way Challenger 2 can take a hit from a modern NATO projectile like MA29A4 or DM73. Maybe it could survive a hit from DM53 or MA29A3 on the turret cheeks, but those projectiles are like 20 years old at this point. This work bounced back and forth as stuff in Britain typically does, and in 2021 specifications for what these upgrades would be were finally agreed on, and the project was named Challenger 3. Almost all the updates on the Challenger 3 are nothing new. They've been available as upgrade packages to the Challenger 2 since 2016. 
Challenger 3 was actually a cooperative development of Germany's Rheinmetall and British BAE, where most of the upgrades are actually of German origin, like the gun and the fire control system. Now, some of the upgrades might have been available back in 2016, as in, they existed, like Atheca thermals, but most of the stuff, like L55A1 gun and the actual fire control system are newer, as is the actual turret. So, technically speaking, you couldn't have made Challenger 3 back in 2016. The X features an autoloader, a crewless turret, and has a sensor system that gives the crew a full 360 degree awareness, which is completely unheard of in a tank. The sensors that give the crew 360 degrees awareness are the all-around cameras, laser warning receivers, missile detection system, and the radar of the active protection system. All of this is great, but it is also something T-14 Armata has as well. The only thing Abrams X actually has that T-14 doesn't in terms of the systems available to the crew, is the loitering munition, which is obviously a big plus for the Abrams in this case. And combined with the rumoured anti-thermal infrared systems developed by BAA back in 2009, that would mean that this tank, at night, is practically invisible. No one ever mentioned, not even as a rumour, that the new Abrams would have BAE's adaptive thermal camouflage system. In fact, there has been no information about the system for at least a decade. It was demonstrated once and it practically died. No one was ever interested in it. Adaptive can be sort of deceiving on the first glance. It is impossible to make a tank invisible in the thermal for several reasons. The demonstration of the adaptive uses the sides of the CV-90 hull for demonstration for a reason. It is pretty big and flat. The problem with this system is that it needs to be installed on top of the tank's surface, and if we look at Abrams X, we will see that a lot of parts are covered in new systems, like laser warning receivers, radars for the active protection system, etc. Now, the reasons why you can't make the tank fully invisible on thermals is because the tank's tracks heat up from friction, guns heat up from shooting, the exhaust is always hot, the area around the engine is also always going to be hot, as will be the roof, where the hatches are usually located, if it is sunny, of course. Adaptive can only help make the tank less visible, but it will never make it fully invisible. And systems like the Barracuda camouflage system or the Russian Akitka already work in reducing the thermal signature of a tank. So we perhaps stopped hearing about Adaptive because it was too expensive for what it offered, when simple, cheaper systems like the Barracuda can achieve similar results, while also providing visual camouflage for the tank. That Bradley is going to turn its autocannon directly onto the sights of the Armata, in a tactic that Bradley crews train for called buttoning, and if the Armata loses that sight, it can't fire. If it needs to reverse, it can't see behind it, and if it loses sight of the Bradley who fires a tow missile at it, then its hard kill system is functionally useless. There is no reason for T-14 to either turn around completely or to keep the turret turned to the front. There are many ways the driver can look outside. The already mentioned camera, his own periscopes, and he also has access to the rear view camera for reversing, and not to mention the cameras for all around view. Now, all of this being said, the APS of T14 is supposed to determine the direction of the incoming ATGM, with either its radar or the IR missile detection system. There is some information that claims the T14's turret would automatically be turned towards the threat, but I'm not sure how real that is. Let's say that it is not the case. As I already mentioned, the crew would get a warning of the incoming missile anyway, and could turn the turret to face the threat. Not to mention that, well, since there is no reason for T-14 to turn around when reversing, the likelihood of a missile being fired into the area not covered by the hard kill system is very unlikely in the first place. This would be it, I believe I covered all the noteworthy mistakes. Of course, there could have been some that I missed, or some that I even made myself, but I believe I covered the most important things. As I said in the beginning, a lot of stuff is correct, like the T-14's production being practically non-existent, as an example. But he still got a lot of things wrong, and as with any mistakes, they should be corrected. I hope you enjoyed this boring video, since I decided not to include any jokes in order to keep everything civil. T-14 is plagued with a lot of production problems, and I'm sure the current sanctions imposed on Russia are not helping either. The future of this tank is completely uncertain, current predictions put the adoption of the tank by 2025, but I believe that is very optimistic. They just keep delaying it, every year they say, next year, trust me. Therefore, I believe we shouldn't believe any of that until we actually see T-14 Armatas rolling off the assembly lines and start seeing actual service outside of the first guards who have been testing the tank 
since its reveal. The thing is also that T14 is not yet actually finalized. There have been changes made to the tank since its first reveal, and some cuts might be imposed in order for Russia to actually afford putting the tank in active service, that is, if they ever decide to do that in the first place. That would be all. If you like my content, you can consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Have a nice day.